but good afternoon and welcome to today's program. I'm Callan Steinman, Curator of Education here at the Georgia Museum of Art. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all today to our curator talk with um, Dr. Asin Kieran. Today's program um, is focused on two um, on, on this exhibition that is a current show that's up at the Georgia Museum of Art of uh, Russian works from the, the museum's collection from two collections, the Parker collection and the Belazelsky belazerski collections. Um, so Dr. Asen Kieran is our presenter today. He is the Parker Curator of Russian Art at the Georgia Museum of Art, and I will hand it over to him for today's presentation. And thank you so much, Callum. Um, thank you all for coming to today's lecture. Um, it's a sacrifice to attend a Zoom meeting on a beautiful day like this, so I really do appreciate it. Um, today's, and thank you, Callan, for organizing uh, this event. Um, today's lecture is dedicated to uh, the very first permanent display of Russian art at the Georgia Museum of Art. The display was made possible because the museum received a very generous grant uh, from the Fraser Parker Foundation um, in a, um, from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and um, because of it, we were able to conceive and design and install a display uh, that highlights some of the most significant works uh, from the Russian art collection at the Georgian Museum of Art. Um, in essence, the Georgian Museum of Art collected several collections of Russian art, several pre-existing collections, the main of which, of course, is the Parker collection. And it was the, the generosity of Mr. Parker that started this project um, in uh, the year 2014. Um, so um, I will talk to you about the three discrete separate collections that have um, um, joined uh, the, the holdings of the Georgia Museum of Art um, and give you a general overview of the display. Um, the Russian project um, at the Georgia Museum of Art uh, started uh, with an exhibition uh, that we mounted in 2013 um, and uh, dedicated to the art patronage of Catherine the Great. I hope you can see the cursor on my screen. This is the exhibition Exuberance of Meaning. Uh, we borrowed works from several major American museums, but in addition to this, uh, we had an opportunity to borrow a set of medals from Mr. Parker, and this was the beginning of our uh, collaboration with him. In 2016, and these are all temporary exhibitions, in 2016, we had the first exhibition based entirely on the Parker collection, Gifts and Prayers, the Romanovs and their subjects. The exhibition has already traveled to two additional venues um, in Minnesota, the Museum of Russian Art, and in El Paso, the Museum of History. Um, the success of Gifts and Prayers um, made possible another gift. We received uh, a gift of, of, uh, of significance, art historical and historical significance, uh, from the, des the descendant of a very important aristocratic dynasty, Russian aristocratic princely family, the Belosalsky Belozerskis, and we featured this collection um, in the next exhibition, One Heart, One Way. You will see some of the important objects from this um, collection shortly. And um, in 2019, we had a second show, a second temporary show based on the holdings of the Parker collection. And these were all temporary exhibitions. Until now, the only object from the Parker collection that was on permanent display was this exquisite uh, mid 18th century silver goblet, which was a special gift bestow bestowed on the Georgia Museum in memory of Mr. William Anderson Parker II. But this was the only object from the Parker collection um, on permanent display. Things changed uh, last November when we were able to mount the permanent uh, exhibition of Russian art um, in um, 
the Dinos Gallery of the new permanent wing of the Georgia Museum of Art. So this is the, the these are the works of art that introduce the display to a visitor. Um, in this selection, you find uh, an 18th century portrait of Peter the Great uh, facing a silver relief from the beginning of the 18th century, showing um, the festivities following an important military victory Peter the Great achieved um, against uh, uh, the King of Sweden, um, Carl XII, and a miniature portrait of Peter the Great, miniature uh, set in gold and decorated with precious stones, probably dating to uh, the 19th century. So Peter the Great is the main theme that introduces the display because our Russian art collection basically uh, centers on Russia um, from the post-Petrovian era. So the reign of Peter the Great is associated with a deliberate, a profound um, westernization of all aspects of Russian, of the Russian state um, and life. And so we thought it was appropriate to, um, to have this arrangement at the entrance into the gallery. Also, it is significant that the portrait of Peter the Great that you see to the left was the very first significant acquisition made by Mr. Parker back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So the small gallery uh, was arranged in a way to allow for two-dimensional works. You see portraits from the Belozelsky, Belozarsky collection, and also objects displayed in special vitrines and combining items from both the Parker and the Belosowski Belosowski collection. They complement, the two collections complement each other in a remarkable way. I will comment on this briefly. So to give you a sense of, of the portraits uh, from the Belosowski Belosowski collection, I would like to start by talking to you about the north wall of the gallery. It features works. We know where exactly that they come from. Uh, they were on display in the two palaces belonging to the Belosowski Belozerskis and located one in the very center of St. Petersburg, right across the river from an imperial palace. And the other one um, was formerly a summer house um, on an island, a private island that belonged to the Belosowski Belozerskis. But originally, this island was the property of Peter the Great. So this 18th century hunting pavilion became the permanent residence of the Princess Belosowski Belozerski in the later part of the 18th century. So everything that, that the Georgian Museum of Art has now that belonged to this collection was on display um, in, in this palace. So here are the two highlights of the display. To the left, you see Prince Alexander. Uh, who was appointed by Catherine the Great to serve as her ambassador, first in the Saxon co court of Dresden, and then um, in, in the Savoy court of Turin. His daughter, Zinaida, whom you see in the portrait to the right, was born um, in Dresden and subsequently grew up in Italy, in the city of Turin. These two portraits were made by famous court portraitists. Um, uh, Prince Alexander was painted by one of the court portraitists in Dresden. Zinaida, whose portrait was created in 1816 uh, during a visit to Italy, was painted by the court portraitist of, of the Habsburg court of Florence. So two remarkable individuals. The portraits that we have, including the portrait of Peter the Great, highlight the significance of, of portraiture in 18th century visual culture and in 18th century Russian culture in general, because even though these are members of the social elite, what we see here is a very important tendency of emphasizing their um, 
um, human qualities, their education, their erudition, their, uh, their um, sensitivities, uh, their creativity. So Prince Alexander is rendered as a poet and, and as a philosopher. And he was, he was a member of two European academies very early in his, in his life. Um, what is also very important is that these portraits were included in a historic exhibition uh, about which books have been written and are still being written. This was an exhibition of historic portraits from Russia set in this beautiful neoclassical palace in St. Petersburg, which Catherine the Great uh, built as a gift to Prince Potemkin uh, in 1905. This historic exhibition uh, opened under the curation, and here, here are uh, images from the catalog. Both these portraits now belong to the Georgian Museum of Art. Um, and um, oh, I'm missing a slide. I'm sorry, I'm missing a slide. Um, sorry about that. But so this was a historic exhibition. It was, um, it was curated by the famous Russian um, art critic and impresario Serge Diaghilev. And these are uh, the reproductions uh, in the catalog published in the early 20th century. So between the two large portraits, there is a small family portrait and then two miniatures. Uh, here they are. This is a family portrait of the prince while still serving as Catherine the Great's ambassador in Dresden. So they hired a villa outside of Dresden, and this is a family portrait uh, from the last years the family spent in Dresden. This, this, uh, this infant that you see in the arms, I, I hope you can see my cursor, uh, this is the nanny, a nanny holding an infant. The infant is Princess Zinaida, whose portrait you just saw dating to 1816. So this is the prince, um, his first wife, uh, his favorite horse, his favorite manservant, and the uh, uh, three of the family dogs. These are the two miniatures, one of them a silver uh, relief showing Prince Alexander, um, and the other his second wife, Anna Grigorievna, who was the heiress of one of the largest industrial fortunes in Europe, uh, from the later part of the 18th century. Her grandfather was the, the founder of the iron industry in Siberia. So the family could easily afford two major palaces in, in St. Petersburg. Their son, the Prince Alexander's son from his second marriage is this young officer uh, shown here in a portrait dating to uh, 1818 or as late as 1820. Um, again, it is, it is uh, uh, another example of a portrait that deliberately highlights the human qualities of the sitter. This is a already highly romanticized vision of this young officer. In the same gallery, uh, we have display cases that deliberately combine objects belonging to both the Parker and the Belusowski Belusersky collection. One way in which these two collections almost miraculously complement each other in a very complete way has to do with uh, the fact that the Parker collection contains many items of uh, militaria. These are uh, objects associated with uh, um, uh, with military life, with military regiments, in particular with one of the most prestigious uh, lifeguards regiments of, of the Russian Empire, the Chevalier Guards. You see a, a uniform, a parade uniform of, office, of an officer from the Chevalier Guard on display in this custom-made vitrine. Um, and this uniform comes from the Parker collection. Uh, what is really remarkable is that um, three generations of the Princess Belosowski Belozerski served in this very prestigious regiment. And we have other items related to the regiment of the Chevalier of the Chevalier Guards, but the uniform itself came from the Parker collection. We have unique objects like this very large uh, silver wreath 
that was given to a major figure, a military engineer uh, who, uh, is, uh, res who is responsible for making major inventions that affected um, the, the, um, the technology of war in the later part of the 19th century. There are no hallmarks. Very few objects like this survived, but there are archival photographs of the St. Petersburg studios of the firm of Carl Fabergé, where you can see in one of them a similar wreath held hanging on the wall. Uh, but there are no hallmarks and we don't have documents that can uh, securely associate the silver wreath uh, with Fabergé, although that's a very likely um, attribution. So here are details uh, show uh, the, a photograph that shows the special custom-made vitrine that we commissioned to be able to show uh, three-dimensional items at the uh, top section of the, of the display case. But you can also see that there are drawers here. And these drawers are lit, and I can show you further details to give you a sense of what we've displayed um, uh, there. Very importantly, this very, um, very special for us uh, display case um, was, uh, um, is actually a gift, a separate gift from the grant um, coming to us uh, because of the generosity of the Fraser Parker Foundation um, in Atlanta. We commissioned this display case um, and um, it was manufactured in Canada. So here are the details that show you the, the way in which we combine items from the two collections. Um, Emperor Nicholas I served as a colonel of the regiment of the Chevalier Guards, and he is wearing a uniform uh, of, of, of an officer from the guards, a medal shows him in profile wearing this uniform, um, and, and a bust uh, from the Parker collection is included because it relates to the same ruler. So, the tall bronze comes from the uh, Belusevsky Belusevsky collection. The metal and the smaller uh, bronze come uh, from the Parker collection. Um, a helmet of the um, officer of the Chevalier Guard a per from the parade uniform is accompanied by two miniature um, pendants, two charms. One from the, showing a copy of the helmet, one from the Belusevsky Belusevsky collection, and the other one from the Parker collection. These were worn by the wives of officers um, of the Chevalier Guard Regiment, and uh, they would be displayed as pendants or as bracelet charms. The one to the left that comes from the Belusevsky Belusevsky uh, collection uh, contains, it's a locket and it contains a photograph of, of Prince Sergei Belusevsky Belusevsky, the father uh, of our donor, Princess Marina. And here is what we display in this uh, special drawers. These drawers contain lighting and, and we use them for the display of miniature objects. These, the top drawer contains a very significant part of the collection. These are the insignia of the Russian orders of chivalry. All Russian orders of chivalry are represented in this drawer and, and not all of the items that, that we own uh, could be displayed here, but there is a certain um, um, visual appeal to the display, hopefully, and also a certain comprehensiveness to it because every one of the, of, of the orders of chivalry is represented here. Um, in the middle drawer, uh, we have a selection of medals and objects that thematically relate to the medals. The Parker collection contains uh, approximately 600 medals. This is just a small selection of them to give you a sense of what the holdings uh, of the museum are. In the bottom drawer of the display case, 
contains badges and jetons, of which are small pectoral signs awarded for special achievements or, or created to commemorate important events um, in individuals' lives. Um, there is a, um, in one of the corners of the gallery, we were able to fit a portrait of um, Emperor Alexander II, the liberator of the Serbs in, in the Russian Empire, and a unique item, a coronation gift that he must have received in the year of his coronation, 1856. This is a cigar box that represents the entire Russian Empire. Uh, the cigar box is decorated with enamel miniatures displaying the coat of arms of all Russian provinces. Next uh, to the cigar box and the portrait of Alexander, we have a small icon display. Um, we've put together this display following the model of icon arrangements as seen in archival photographs from the late 19th century that shows the private chambers of, of the family of the Russian Tsar. That's how icons were displayed, superimposed tears um, were, were, uh, were usually seen in these displays. And, and under normal circumstances in 19th and early 20th century Russia, this would be a display placed on the east wall of, of a chamber. So here we combine um, items from the Parker collection and a gift that we received from the uh, heirs of, of the Fitzgeralds, um, a family from Atlanta. Um, and um, next to them, we have a display case full of silver, combining again Parker and Belosowski, Belosowski items. And in this display, uh, we've tried to follow um, the, the, the history of changes in terms of style in Russian decorative arts. So to the left, you have objects that represent the style of the 15th and 16th century. This is a 17th century object. This is, this, these two are 18th century and then there is 19th century. Um, and that's the rest of the, of the display case. So in one display case, using different kinds of silver objects, we were able to illustrate a certain history, the, the history uh, of the changes of style um, over a long period of time. And here are some details. These objects that you see here, this one, these two, they, they represent the 15th and the 16th century, but they were copies made in the 19th century of specific, very famous items owned by Russian museums, by the Russian Kremlin Museum, for example, this, this particular object. They were given as name day gifts to one of the princes, Belosowski, Belosersky, by his um, children. And of course, we have, we have Mr. Parker's cup, uh, from made uh, in 1762, the first year of the reign um, of, of uh, Catherine the Great. This particular silver uh, uh, cup uh, was given to uh, Prince Alexander's father who achieved the heights of, of his career during the reign of uh, Empress Elizabeth, Peter the Great's daughter, whose profile is rendered in, in, in this medallion right here, a famous item from the, from the Parker collection dating to 1856, the first year um, of, from the reign of Alexander II. What is remarkable about this item, the tall, the large silver um, trophy, is that it represents um, Rococo revival style, which is well familiar to many lovers of American silver. Uh, Callan, I see two questions, but I haven't read them. Can you help me with these two questions? I can. I can only see one question. So somebody may have sent you a direct question um, oh. in the chat. But uh, Winnie did ask um, 
how you choose the wall colors for the exhibits. She says, I remember a beautiful green from a past show and this midnight blue is really wonderful. Yes, thank you for this question. Uh, the beautiful green was very specific because it, it was associated with interior spaces in which um, Alexander II, the Russian emperor liberator, Alexander II lived and worked. And because our show, Gifts and Prayers, was centered around Alexander II, uh, that was a meaningful choice. The same color was used for the two additional venues of Gifts and Prayers in Minneapolis and in El Paso. This was a neutral dark color that had to fit, I can tell you exactly how we chose it. We, um, I have a, a, a slide with swatches, if I can find it. Um, we, uh, there were um, limited choices to what we could show on here. We had to find a color that matches the color of the special order display case. Um, and uh, because the choices were limited, it's a special paint uh, with special coating. So we had to find something uh, that would be a very close match to this color in order to make the display case disappear into the space and to allow the objects on display to stand out. Um, thank you, Asen. Thank you so much. So, so yes, I know where I was. And so there are a, a selection of silver objects stands to tell the story of each one of these items, but also to illustrate the history of style. Um, in addition to so generously giving us more than 2,400 objects, in addition to establishing an endowment, Mr. Parker donated a collection of research books, which were essential um, in um, making possible the, all the research. Um, on the Parker collection that took place in the course of the last six or seven years. So these books are exceedingly rare. Many of them are extravagantly expensive, but without them, uh, it would not have been possible to, to do the research uh, that enabled the exhibitions that we have already organized. And in order to acknowledge this, we've established a small, uh, the, the museum's library has a small discrete unit that we call the Parker Collection Reference Library. And we've created a separate uh, book uh, plate for, for, the, uh, for the volumes from this uh, research uh, library collection. And um, it shows a bird and berries and we wanted to make it meaningful. So the model are early Christian and late antique depictions of the souls of the righteous in paradise. As you see in this detail uh, of the mosaic decoration on the east wall of the Cathedral of San Vitale in Ravenna. Uh, but the bird itself is a bird that is uh, seen in North America and in Russia. The plant itself is a plant that grows in Europe and. Um, um, and in America, and here are the specific details. But I wanted you to know that, so this is, this is a very thoughtful way of, of helping a museum and a team of researchers, giving them access not only to the objects, but also to the, to the resources that would allow the work to take place. And, all, and in addition to this, we received this collection, the Parker collection, with the most unbelievable, um, unbelievably orderly and thorough archive. Look at all the color coding. Uh, Mr. Parker was actually the first curator of this collection. Uh, every item is described and, and listed with, with information that is now uh, the, the foundation for our uh, museum records. 
Uh, in addition to this, we have a thorough documentation of the negotiation with dealers, with gallerists, and, and that allows us to trace firmly the provenance of each object and also to gain knowledge about the decisions involving uh, the specific choices made to also acknowledge what are the objects that were offered for acquisition, but the collector chose not to purchase them. So all this is in the Parker archive, which is now um, at the Georgian Museum of Art. And then once all this was put in place, Mr. Parker acquired uh, collections that were offered to us. So entire collections were purchased. So here you see the items uh, uh, from the collection um, of um, Vladimir von Tsurikov, a historian, um, and a museum uh, specialist and museum director um, from America who collected in Europe and in America uh, basically after the end of the Cold War. The acquisition of this entire collection that numbers uh, more than 140 objects filled a special lacuna in the Parker collection, which um, didn't have a great number of religious art. Mr. Parker favored court ceremonial, military items, military history, uh, and he had very few icons. He had them because they were associated with members of the imperial family. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity to enrich the holdings of the Georgian Museum by adding several objects associated with devotional art. And this is these are the first snapshots taken in the vaults of the museum after we uh, unpacked this collection. It was very exciting. The star of the Vladimir von Tsurikov collection, in a way, is this remarkable miniature portrait from 1808, which we were not able to display. In, so it's not currently um, in the gallery, but we will find a way to feature it because it's such an important work of art. It dates to 1808, and it shows a historic figure uh, of great renown. Um, he is a character in Leo Tolstoy's uh, novel, War and Peace. This is uh, uh, Prince Kutuzov, the uh, commander of the Russian army fighting Napoleon uh, during uh, the War of 1812. So this is a miniature portrait that identifies Kutuzov as a count. This is before he was made, he was elevated to uh, princely dignity in 1812. This is a portrait from 1808. And here is another detail. There is a lot we have to do. We have to clean it. Uh, we also were able to establish that the frame damaged the um, um, partially the periphery of the painted area. So the, there is a great deal of work uh, to be done, but it is a very rare example, signed portrait right here. This is the name of the, of the artist. And there is the ear as well. Kutuzov was a major figure here to the right. You see his uh, larger than life-size portrait uh, by George Dow. And this portrait is now on display in the War Gallery or the 1812 Gallery um, in the Hermitage in the Winter, in the Winter Palace um, in St. Petersburg. And just to give you a sense of the variety and the richness um, of the devotional items uh, from the newly acquired of Vladimir von Surikov collection, I wanted you to see some of the brass icons. Most of these icons could be worn as pendants. Um, and that's why you see them equipped uh, with, with finials that would allow them to be suspended. Some of the silver enamel miniatures, the ones that you, that you see one um, on the slide uh, to the right, were so small. This is a thumb, uh, thumb drive. And look at this miniature pendant. It shows the severed head of St. John the Baptist, a gruesome subject, but if your name is John or Joanna, you would love to have it because if you wear it as a pendant, then you would benefit from the protection of St. John the Baptist.
Some of the items are so elaborate. For example, this cross would be displayed in a private home and it would be rendered, it would be placed um, in, in a special corner on a special shelf together with other icons. Overall, you can see that there are multiple religious scenes. So there is the crucifixion and the holy women and Saint John, uh, um, the divine, but you also see individual scenes, compositions showing various events from the life of Christ. So the overall rendition is reminiscent of an iconostasis. The iconostasis is the screen that separates the nave from the altar area of a church. So if you have this cross in your home and you pray to it, then you have the sense that you're in a holy place in a church, even when you are not able to go to pray in a church. So you will see in the slide that I will show you uh, that we found a way to incorporate into the display these remarkable items. They all date to the 18th and 19th century. But what is uh, notable is that since th they were made from casts, the originals were very old. So the iconography, the style, look at this, the, the elegant proportions of, of the holy women at the cross. This echoes the style of painting um, in Byzantium uh, during the 13th and 14th century, if not even earlier. Uh, so other items are this large mother of pearl, mother of pearl, uh, relief icon showing the resurrection. Objects like this were usually acquired by pilgrims visiting Jerusalem for Easter. Um, a small, fairly modest icon came to us with this purchase showing um, apostles Peter and Paul. But look at the hallmark. What is important for us is that we can place exactly this icon into its historic context. Uh, here, in, I, if you can follow my, um, if you see my cursor, 1787. This is during the reign of Catherine the Great. And then upside down, you see the cult of arm of St. Petersburg, two anchors, uh, a sea anchor and a river anchor and a scepter. So this is an example of painting, of devotional painting from the reign of Catherine the Great. Liturgical silk um, items came to us. These are special covers made of silk and, and uh, decorated with natural pearls that were used to cover the holy gifts carried from one part of the sanctuary to the altar where they would be consecrated. And there is so much to unravel about all these objects because on the back of one of these liturgical uh, uh, textiles, um, you can read the name of the donor, Countess um, uh, Countess, um, I cannot remember her last name. Uh, I found her, I know who she is, but I don't know what was the church uh, uh, who received this special gift uh, from the Countess. More liturgical textiles, um, some um, priests' crosses, and a set of works on paper. So these are not on display. We will not be able to display many of them for some time because they will have to go through um, a long time-consuming process of cleaning and conservation. But just to give you a sense how the collection continues uh, uh, to, to grow. So Peter the Great, this was uh, two 18th century empresses. Are we running out of time? No, I don't think so. We've okay. got, I think if we um, wrap up within the hour, so before two o'clock, that's perfectly How up. much time before we start taking questions? Oh, we um, have. Well, it's, it's 1.38 now, so we could, if you want to allow maybe five or 10 minutes for questions at the end, okay. and then if we go a bit beyond that, that's fine. That's okay. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. Um, and so there are works on paper that came to us with these most recent acquisitions. As a rule, uh, these seem to be works um, that were made in Russia but sent to various Western European countries, most likely to announce the ascent to the throne of a new ruler.
So in this case, for example, uh, we have this very well-known um, uh, portrait of Catherine the Great issued uh, shortly after her ascent to the throne in 1762. This is one of her predecessors, uh, Anna Ioannovna, a cousin of Peter the Great, um, who ruled um, Russia uh, before Elizabeth Petrovna. So this is Catherine the Great's son, Emperor Paul the First. You see, this is the the, the, the text on the uh, print is in English because it was meant to be sent to, uh, to Britain and maybe even to the United States. Um, and this is Emperor Nick Nicholas I um, at his deathbed. This uh, unique print, there's, uh, there's a limited number of prints of this kind issued. And this one was placed in a special um, leather bound album containing just this one print. Larger um, examples of, of prints of Nicholas II, of Nicholas I and his son, Alexander II. And a gift came to us, a very important gift. Um, this is an altar gospel book dating to the reign of Alexander II. So this is a, a gospel book uh, printed and bound in the most elaborate way um, in the 1870s. Uh, we haven't, it, the object is not here yet. <laughs> Bill Island is going to deliver it um, in the next month or so, uh, but it's an exquisite example of, of a liturgical item of great significance. An altar of an Eastern Orthodox Church will not, would not be fully equipped and prepared for ceremonies without having um, an altar book. Uh, we know that this altar book was used in, a, in an imperial chapel, in the chapel of an imperial palace, because we have an imperial crown on the cover. Under normal circumstances, altar books would have a depiction of Christ's resurrection. In this case, we have a, a medieval style ornamentation. Uh, what we have, um, these are the elements surrounding the crown um, and they are made of brass and silver. So we have to clean this object a lot because the darker parts of it that you see there is yellowish, uh, there are yellowish intertwined uh, elements, but the darker ones, this is silver and we have the hallmarks. So we can situate it very clearly. The, it, the object was made in St. Petersburg uh, in, seven, in 1874. And here are some details of this object uh, with large frontispieces showing each one of the four evangelists and a large, uh, you know, and a large depiction of the full page depiction of the crucifixion, very significantly because this is supposed to be a materialized divine word the gospel, we have heavenly colors that appear into different shades, but in silk velvet, they appear on the front and, and the back covers. And we have moiré, lighter shade of green um, on the inner covers uh, of this object. So once, uh, once people learned about um, our Russian project and once, uh, once people visited our exhibitions, objects continued to come to us. For example, these two icons you, you have already seen in the slide showing the new icon display um, in the permanent wing. Uh, this, is, this, the, uh, this, this is a photograph that shows the icons when they came to us almost two years ago. Uh, the, the, Fitz, the Fitzgerald family, after visiting the exhibition, uh, the reluctant autocrat collectively made the decision, the, the siblings uh, made the decision to donate their parents to family icons uh, to us. These are exquisite examples of very high end devotional art from the second half of the 19th century. Remarkably, both these icons came to the United States uh, with uh, Armand Hammer, and they were sold in Armand Hammer's gallery 
um, in the 1930s and 1940s, and eventually uh, both icons made it into the Fitzgerald family. They, the Fitzgerald's uh, parents, who are now deceased, gave these uh, icons as gifts uh, to each other. So it's a very touching story, but it's also a wonderful way to enrich our holdings of devotional art. So we were very fortunate to receive this, uh, these gifts. Um, so I, since we have a little bit of time, I just wanted to give you a sense of how much work, effort and planning went into designing and installing uh, this display. So uh, the last venue for, for our exhibition, Gifts and Prayers, was in El Paso. And as I mentioned, um, uh, in El Paso, they used the same Alexander II green that we had here in 2016. But when the objects came back to us, we were able to install them in a gallery in which we had one part of the display of gifts and prayers in 2016. And this is actually a photograph, an installation photograph of our display with the green color, the original venue with the green color from 2016. So this is the gallery where our permanent display is now. There in the center, we had the selection of badges and jetons. And then we started working on creating the, the virtual model for the display. Um, and Elizabeth, how a wonderful, um, a wonderful um, uh, member of the art handlers team uses very successfully this software. And she was able to create this model that allowed us to make the best decisions about the placement of the items and how to fit as many objects as possible. So these are some snapshots. And um, um, you can see how in advance, we knew exactly how much wall surface we would have and how much the large new vitrine would protrude uh, from the wall to come into the center of the of the gallery. The icon displayed comes, uh, these are not the icons currently on display. Uh, this was an icon display we incorporated into the, the reluctant autocrat, but we needed it here as a placeholder. We had to make additional custom order display cases. This is the one for the silver. This is the one for the silver wreath. And, and there are various snapshots of the process of, uh, this is Todd for scale after he just installed the vitrine. Um, the vitrine came with two experts from Canada who installed it and made sure that the lighting works all over in, in the drawers and in the uh, top vertical part of the display. So I showed you this slide already. It was a long discussion how to make uh, so that the vitrine just disappears into the dark space in order to allow the objects to shine. There are snapshots of the arrangements of the objects in the gallery and in the vaults. This is uh, the final arrangement uh, of, of the devotional objects. And then I have details of some of these brass icons. Um, these are selection of saints forming a procession. The cross that I already pointed out to you. Look how exquisite these figures are. The proportions and the graceful curves uh, of the silhouettes of the figures. This goes back to the highest style Byzantine painting from, from the... For the, from the uh, from the late 14th century. So these are pendant icons. Uh, this is an icon that shows an, a very important icon. You see that this is an icon that contains an icon and the, sh the scene depicted here shows the arrival of this icon, the Holy Mother of Vladimir to the city of Moscow in the 14th century. Um, and then um, this marks the, the, the period of time when this icon serves as the supernatural miraculous protector uh, of the city of Moscow, an icon showing uh, the birth of Christ, the nativity of Christ, a pendant that shows uh, the last judgment with the, select, with the selection of saints. And I wanted you to see this because I have a parallel for it. Look at the similarities. So this is a miniature item made of brass that is a triptych 
you can wear it against your heart as a pendant and feel the benefits of this sacred image. Every time it touches your chest and every time your heart beats, it's a repeated prayer. Then you can take it off and you can open the wings of, of the triptych to reveal the image in the center of the interior, and then you can pray to it, you can face it and pray to it. Um, and in terms of its content, in terms of its iconography, and even in terms of the style to a great degree, this 18th century object is so close to a classic work of Byzantine art dating to the 10th century, this exquisite ivory triptych now in the Louvre. So the scene is at the top is the same. The gestures, the iconography, even the proportions to a great degree are the same. And then there is a selection of saints. All the saints join in prayer on your behalf if you have this item and you wear it uh, for your spiritual benefit. Now we have 10 minutes left. I would like, I propose that we stop now in order to allow for questions and comments. I see that there are three new. Yeah, so we have a question um, actually about the, the piece that you have on the screen now from Sage asking uh, what, what is the size of the wearable triptych? Two and a half inches. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yep. Um, and then, and then Winnie asks also. She asked about a, a piece you were, you had on the screen a little bit ago about a ladle. She said, "Yes, she let me show you the ladle." I and know. Is asking if you could talk a little bit more about that, and also she's wondering if it's for wine. I can't remember if you mentioned that or not. Yes, I didn't mention it. It's this ladle. This ladle is Georgian. It's from the state of Georgia. Uh, an ancient medieval uh, state um, with its own uh, very um, esteemed tradition of winemaking and, of course, uh, wine consumption. So rich uh, objects like this are, um, were used during the period of time, which was the case for, for centuries and centuries, when wine was stored in large ceramic vessels buried in soil within special storage chambers. So in order to, to uh, get wine from, from a ceramic vessel buried basically with, with an opening on the level of the floor of a storage chamber, uh, one needed uh, an object with a long handle. And that's why the traditional design of uh, wine ladles. This one is so elaborate. It's made of solid silver. It's very, very heavy. Um, in the, it is inscribed um, and given um, as, a, as a gift to, um, to one of the ancestors of our um, donor, Princess Marina. There was a major battle in the middle of the 19th century uh, between the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire on the, in the mountains of, of, the of the country of Georgia. And um, this young officer who distinguished himself received this as a gift. Uh, what I cannot show you in this photograph is the interior of the ladle. So the bowl of the ladle, we display it so that the bottom is seen when the inscription is rendered. But the interior of the bowl is equally fascinating, if not more uh, so. It contains um, a, an, a lotus, uh, a, a highly stylized, enameled in the same way with dark blue and gold, depiction of a lotus flower. But it is, it is there in the center of the bowl, but it is below the, the, the top level that would be the level of wine. If the, the ladle is full with wine, you wouldn't be able to see the, the, the lotus flower. It's only after you have some of the wine and you feel the beneficial effect of, of, of wine consumption, then you, you, you see the lotus. It's like a revelation, a special 
supernatural gift that is given to you. So it's a Georgian ladle given to this very important aristocratic officer who distinguished himself. There are more questions. Thank you, Asen. Um, so I've, um, just to let everybody in, who's joining us know that um, we have, I've, I've unmuted everybody or I've given you permission to unmute yourself. So if you'd like to ask a question directly, you can do that too, or you can continue to put them in the chat, either whatever you're comfortable with. Um, we have a question from Mary asking, what was the most rewarding or exciting part of curating this exhibit? Well, thank you so much. This is a very good question, but it's difficult to answer it because there's so much that is so rewarding. Um, I would say the most rewarding thing is to see how in the last five years, six years, our holdings of Russian art grew from zero to more than 2,600 objects. And how, and, and the, it was really wonderful to feel the frustration of not being able to show even a fraction of the most significant works, because now we have so many of them. And now we can we have a way to tell so many stories. The story stories related to uh, the history of art collecting. Uh, we speak. We can. We can. We can tell stories about the biography of objects. This is a very intellectually ambitious way to refer to the provenance of works because they carry with them the provenance of works carry cultural meanings that are relevant. So. It was very, it was very rewarding. I'm very excited that we have it and we will rotate objects. So you will have a reason to come see uh, the display uh, more than once. Thank you. And then we have a question from Patrick Mizell asking, could a mirror be used to show the interior of the ladle? Could it be a subtle joke from Homer, um, Odysseus and the Lotus Eaters? Thank you, Patrick. So nice to hear from you. Uh, yes. The problem is that one of the petals of the lotus is broken and we have to reattach it. And we haven't done this yet. So we're basically covering up for a problem that we have to, but it's so complicated because we are afraid that hitting the object, the metal, the silver might impact the enamel. And, but it is a great idea. That's what we should do. Absolutely. Patrick is right. Thank you. Any other questions for us then? Thank you so much, Asen, for sharing. About thank you. For, thank you to all of you. I did have a question, which I sent. Um, Please. Oh, I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah, I don't know. I, maybe I didn't send it correctly. But my question is about the brass icon, pendant icon. And my understanding that somebody pointed out, actually a priest, was that these icons were also blessed and the troops wore them into battle for protection. And, oh, of course. And you know, if they were over their hearts, sometimes they saved their lives perhaps, or maybe it was because of the spiritual intervention. That is absolutely true. These are, these are common people's icons. Right, because I have one that I would like for you to see that's been in my yeah, I would love to look at it. Well, remember that the story about icons worn as pendants uh -huh. is, is really well known because there is a famous episode in Leo Tolstoy's novel, War and Peace. When the main character, uh, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky goes to war to fight Napoleon in 1805, his sister, Princess Mary, gives him an icon that saves his life because in the Battle of Austerlitz, Prince Andrei is wounded and he is fallen on the field holding the banner of his regiment mm -hmm. and French soldiers rob him and take this icon, but Napoleon comes, that's the story told in Tolstoy, Napoleon comes, looks at, um, uh, at the, the fallen prince and says, voila un bel mort, uh, look, behold a beautiful death. And because of the admiration of Napoleon for Prince uh, Andre, the icon is returned to him. It was a pendant, it saved his life. Mm -hmm. It was most likely an icon like the, the many, that we have now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Great. Thank you so much. I'm glad we were able to catch that last question. And I'm sorry if I missed Thank it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you all so much. Oh, and if